Bernard McGinn woont en werkt aan de Universiteit van Chicago. Zo'n 15 jaar geleden vatte hij het ambitieuze project op om de hele christelijke westerse mystiek in kaart te brengen. En daarnaast bestudeerde hij ook nog de Joodse mystiek. Toch zijn het de begijnen van de lage landen over wie McGinn graag vertelt. Hadewig, Beatrice van Nazareth en Margareta Porete. McGinn kwam naar Antwerpen op uitnodiging van het Ruusbroekgenootschap om de voorstelling bij te wonen van de opera Omnia. Bernard McGinn, you are widely recognized as the preeminent scholar of the history of mysticism in the Western Christian tradition. Now, what is, in your view, the contribution of the mystics of the Low Countries? I like to t think about mysticism uh, the way the great uh, theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar talked about uh, theology as he said, theological truth is symphonic. That is that you need a whole orchestra to make a beautiful sound with, with different instruments and different colors and different timbres. And so for me, the mysticism of the Low Countries is part of this great orchestra, in a sense. Uh, that is, it has its contribution to make and it's very important. And its contribution, though, fits within this wider framework of the history of Christian mysticism. And in that sense, the particular contribution, I think, of the, the Low Countries is part of what we can call vernacular mysticism. It's when mystical traditions move into the language of the people. And the Dutch were the pioneers. The, the earliest vernacular mystical text that we have is from Beatrice of Nazareth, writing in the very first decades of the 13th century. So the, the, the Dutch language is really a pioneer in the vernacular mystical uh, traditions in, in that sense. And so that's all part of this great symphony, though. Uh, but the, uh, its significance is it was early, it was important, and it influenced many other mystical traditions. Can normal, everyday people be mystics, too? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, many people in the 20th mm -hmm. century have used the phrase everyday mysticism. And I think that's a, a fine phrase, because many mystics have argued throughout the course of history that mysticism is found in the everyday, in the life that we live. Meister Eckhart is a perfect example of mm. this. How do you open your eye? That's the task. <laughs> and I think that's what the mystics really uh, invite us to, is to the very difficult, and I, it's not easy, the very difficult task of having your eyes opened to the reality of the divine in the world around us. And uh, it's done in very, very different ways. Let me use Meister Eckhart as an example. Um, Eckhart's preaching is among the greatest monuments of Western mysticism. His sermons are theologically extremely difficult, mm -hmm. and yet they were very popular in his time. And we also find them theologically very challenging. One of the things that Eckhart loves to do is to say things that are outrageous. For instance? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, God gives birth to me just as he gives birth to the Son in eternal life. There is no difference. There is no difference between mm -hmm. me and the eternal Son. Now, you know, this is outrageous. That means that I'm the same as the, as the second person in the Trinity. Why is Eckhart saying that? Mm -hmm. He's saying it because he wants to wake his audience up to the fact that on one level, not on every level, but on one level it is true, but we tend to forget it. That is, we forget that in the, what Eckhart called the ground of the soul, we are indeed divine. Now, Eckhart was challenged by many people and said, how can you say that? That's unorthodox, that's heretical, etc., etc." Eckhart would always say, but that's not the whole of the truth. On our deepest level, we are indeed divine, we are one with God, but we also exist on a created level where we are different from God, where we are sinful, where we're in need of reform and conversion. Uh, his point, though, is to say the outrageous, to open the eyes of his audience to the fact that they've forgotten the inner core of divinity that they have in the ground of the soul. <laughs> Considering 
you are here invited mm -hmm. for the Ruisbroek Society, and mm -hmm. you have written about Ruisbroek too. Mm -hmm. Who was Ruisbroek? Well, Ruisbroek was uh, a uh, young man born outside of Brussels uh, who went into the city of Brussels and uh, was trained uh, and educated there mm -hmm. and ordained. This is in the very early part of the uh, 14th century. And in the 1330s, uh, in part of his care of souls and mm -hmm. his guidance of souls as a young priest in Brussels, he began writing spiritual, today we would call mystical uh, treatises. It was a controversial time. There were great debates over true and false mysticism. And I think that part of why Rusbrook began writing was to help the people he was guiding to distinguish between good and bad, the true and false, views of, uh, of mysticism. Eventually, after some 10 or 15 years, he and several other priests decided to retreat from the city and their active care of souls and they, uh, outside into a place called Grolendal, which in those days was really out in the woods, yes. um, and to found really a little hermitage where the mm. three of them uh, could live. Eventually, that hermitage grew into a house of Augustinian canons, uh, priests who would live according to a monastic life. Mm -hmm. And Rusbrook spent the rest of his very long life there. He dies in the late 14th century, almost 90 years of old, which is uh, age, which is very mm -hmm. unusual in the medieval period. Mm -hmm. And he leaves us a series of vernacular treatises. There are 11 of them all together of different lengths, which are among the greatest works in, in the history of, of Christian mysticism. Were they interested in that kind of difficult theology. Well, it's like the case of Eckhart. Yeah. Today, uh, we think if anybody preached Eckhart's sermons from the pulpit, everybody would scratch their heads and walk out. Yeah. I'm sure people scratched their heads in Eckhart's day as well, but they kept listening. And similarly, with, with Rusbrook's difficult theology, they knew there was something there that was very important for them, even though at times he could be a difficult author uh, to read. But they felt that the message, the kernel within his, uh, his difficult theology was something that could change, change their lives. And I think that's why people still read Rusbrook today, and he's read very widely today. At the conference this morning uh, here, we had people talking about translating Rusbrook into not only the Western languages, English and, uh, and French, but into Hungarian, into Japanese. I mean, when you think about that, this, this mm -hmm. is really remarkable. But Rusbrook today is, is being read on an international level in dozens of languages. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's rather a pity that the language in our churches gets simplified so much as to never talk anymore about these things? I, I agree with you 100% in the sense that I often ask uh, people when, who have listened to sermons in Catholic churches which I attend, have you ever heard a, a, have you heard a good sermon recently about the Trinity? Very rare. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, sometimes we, uh, I think, unfortunately, priests shy away from the fundamental truths of the Christian faith because they say, oh, they're too difficult. Of course they're difficult, but that's why they need to be preached. And everybody who was to get up and preach about the Trinity would feel insufficient. If you didn't feel insufficient, something mm -hmm. would be wrong with you. But that still doesn't let you off the hook, as we would say. This is the message that needs to be uh, presented. So I do think... The sermonic uh, practice today mm. often lacks depth. Now, that's a generalization. There are many, I've heard many mm. wonderful sermons, of mm. course, and I'm sure you mm. and, and mm. others have as well. But in general, there's a great, if you will, shallowness to preaching today. about uh, love, does he also mean eros? I think he certainly means, uh, means eros. And uh, the word, it's common both in Middle High German and in uh, Netherlandish languages, minna, really is a love that is an extremely powerful force of yearning, which is, I think, also what the Greek term eros was originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, many... Uh, Theologians have said, well, Christian love is only agape, you know, uh, which is the text they find in the New Testament. But from the beginning, uh, after the New Testament, other Christians said, if God is truly love, 
then that love includes not only agapic outpouring of generosity, but also yearning, yearning for inner enjoyment. The, the great mystical, mysterious mystical author who's sometimes known as Pseudo Dionysius or Dionysius, who's writing around the year 500, uh, is uh, very, uh, very clear on the fact that we have to describe God as yearning eros as well as, uh, as, the, over, as the power of, of agape. And so there is a deep erotic tradition in Christian mysticism uh, that often makes use, of course, of highly sexual language uh, taken very often from the Song of Songs in the Bible, mm -hmm. but also from the sexual language of the courtly literature of medieval Europe, which is transposed into mystical texts because any form of love that is good in itself is part of, if you will, that package of love mm -hmm. which has its, its source in God. Now, all forms of love can be misused and have been misused, mm -hmm. But you can't say that one is good and another one is bad mm -hmm. from the Christian tradition. You can't say erotic love is bad. That would be heresy. <laughs> <laughs> and you get burned at the stake Well, for that. maybe not burned, <laughs> but you should at least be corrected. <laughs> Strenuously corrected. Okay. Going to the Begin movement, you have written about it, the flowering of mysticism, men and women in the new mysticism. What, what was that movement of Begins? Well, it was one of the great creations in the history of the religious life, uh, certainly in the medieval period. Around the year 1200, and it's a mm. pretty clear divine point, suddenly there were new forms of mystical life, there were new forms of religious life created all over Europe. Mm. Uh, why, you might say? Well, we can talk about different factors. Mm. Obviously, European society is changing. Uh, there is a greater middle class. Uh, there's greater literacy, et cetera, et cetera. But we still don't have any clear explanation uh, you know, some of these things lie beyond easy explanation. You could say it's a great movement of the Holy Spirit. This is what a believer would say is the fundamental reason. And the Beguines were part of this new creation. And they were a new style of life primarily for women. There were men called beg Begards who lived a comparable life, but it's primarily for women. And what makes it unique is these women live in the world a very dedicated religious life, mm -hmm. but not under a traditional religious rule and not separated out into a cloister. And they live usually in some form of activity, an active life, active both for themselves and for their concerns for others. And yet they're so deeply devoted to mm -hmm. an intense inner life that we would speak of as a mystical life. And it originates, of course, here in the Low Countries, which was a kind of seedbed for many religious movements mm -hmm. in the late medieval period. Suppose uh, I'm in the year 1200 and I walk the streets of Antwerp. How would I recognize these uh, Beguines? Well, they usually, they didn't necessarily wear a traditional religious garb, but they would show in some way by their garb that they were indeed not the ordinary citizen. You had to take on some kind of shawl or something else like that. And they would, of course, live in a small community. Uh, you would see them in your parish church worshiping together. You might often see them doing what we would call great works of charity to mm -hmm. others in their, in their community. And you would, of course, recognize them often for their, the, the, the so deepness of their devotion, uh, mm -hmm. both in their parish life and, mm -hmm. uh, and elsewhere. And it's very interesting, in the very beginning, the movement of the Beguines was very much encouraged by the local clergy. Um, and even by very powerful figures in, in the church because they thought this new style of religious life was a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit, particularly in an age when the church was being threatened by heretical movements and other groups. Mm -hmm. As the century, the 13th century goes on, people begin to suspect the Beguines. What, 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 <laughs> yeah, what, what, what was it exactly? why they said um, Beguines are heretical or, or why they wanted to push them out of, so of the society? Uh, not so much the society as the, as the ecclesiastical society. Um, it's again, it's, it's a very complicated issue mm -hmm. and we still mm -hmm. are learning much about it today. But there certainly were Beguines whose teachings were seen 
as dangerous and disruptive. So what, what did they do? Marguerite teach? Porret is the perfect yes. uh, example of this. And uh, she was a northern French Beguine. Um, she was probably born sometime maybe around 1270s or 80s. She comes to our attention the very end of the 13th century, the early 14th century. She composed a book in Old French called The Mirror of Simple Annihilated Souls which uh, still survives today and is one of, I think, the most uh, profound uh, mystical treatises of the entire medieval period. It's, it's a very, very difficult text. But she wandered, she was a wandering Beguine. She wandered around in northern France and probably in, in the southern Low Countries, disseminating and teaching this text to people. A local bishop reads this text and tells her this is dangerous and heretical and she needs to stop disseminating it. She then finds three theologians, including one very well-known Paris master of theology, who read the text and approve it. So she continues to disseminate the work by mm. copying it and having people copying it and by teaching it. Then she comes to the attention of the Grand Inquisitor in Paris, and she is arrested by the Inquisition uh, and tried by the Inquisition and eventually condemned as a heretic and she's burned at the stake in Paris in 1310. But what idea did she spread? Well, part of it was this idea that she can become totally one with God. Part of it was she uses the phrase about bidding goodbye to the virtues. Now, you know, that sounds very dangerous, but if you read it in context, what she means by saying goodbye to the virtues is when you begin the spiritual life, it's hard to practice the virtues. You have to work at it. You are, in a certain way, at the service of the virtues. As you progress, eventually, virtuous action becomes second nature, becomes connatural. And so you don't think about, oh, I have to be good this way and I have to do this and that. You can bid the virtues goodbye. You, you bid them goodbye as taskmasters. Mm -hmm. But she's not saying that you become antinomian and do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. She's saying that you, by practicing the virtuous life, you eventually reach a stage where you don't have to think about being virtuous anymore. But a phrase saying goodbye to the virtues sounds dangerous. Third issue, just to, uh, she yeah. talks about the difference between little church and big church. Little church is the yeah. church of the clergy and reason. Big church is the church of love. Ecclesiastics yes. were not happy with that, with that particular distinction. Mm -hmm. Now, she feels the two churches need each other, but she feels that little church has the problem of not listening to big church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I keep wondering, Hildegard of Bingen said more or less the same things, criticized the church leaders very severely, yep. <laughs> and she never had any problems with the Inquisition. Probably. Well, it, it, there's no Inquisition in her time. That's, yeah. That's mm, part probably. of it. But, uh, and uh, it's, some of this is contextual uh, in the sense that historical ages differ from one another and that the fears of heresy that begin in the late 12th century and go on through the 13th century meant the 13th century church of uh, Marguerite Port's time was far more repressive mm -hmm. than the church of Hildegard's Hildegard. time. Yes. Hildegard also was much better established, let us remember. She came from a very noble family and had mm. extremely powerful support. Nevertheless, Hildegard was a controversial figure in her time. And her letters, the many hundreds of which survive, show that. I mean, she had to fight her way and make her case. Uh, not everybody accepted her. There were many mm. critics who said, you know, this woman who's talking and criticizing should go back into her monastery and shut up. I mean, uh, but Hildegard was extremely powerful figure, an extremely able figure, who was able to make her way into a unique kind of position. Would she have been able to do that a century and a half later? Well, these are the hypotheticals of history. We don't it's, know. It's interesting. We always tend to look at past ages, um, like, for instance, in the 12th century as being more backwards, and that we always increase in knowledge, but that's not true. The 12th century was even more enlightened, as I can use that word, yes. than the 13th century. In some ways. So we, we can have backfalls yeah. in culture. Is that we, possible? We confuse material progress with progress of the human spirit. Of course, materially, we're much better off today than any people in the Middle mm -hmm. Ages where we're mm -hmm. much more comfortable, we're much more mm -hmm. better fed, we have better medicine, etc. 
Uh, and material progress is, is not a bad thing at all. Would I like to live in the 12th century? Well, I yeah. would if I were healthy. <laughs> but yeah. material progress is not spiritual progress. And spiritual progress goes through cycles in a certain way. And, uh, and indeed, we think of the medieval uh, listener in the pew as an ignorant peasant who didn't, most of them didn't know how to read and write. And yet they listened to Meister Eckhart's sermons and loved them. That's worth thinking about. Did Hadwig or Beatrice of Nazareth, why didn't they have any problems with the Inquisition or did they? Well, we don't know a lot about Hadwig's life. She's a great mystery. Mm. All we have are the texts, the wonderful texts, both the poetic texts and the visions and the various letters. Indeed, we're not even quite sure when she lived. The, the standard uh, view is that she lived in the middle of the 13th century, but... Uh, and in, that's in Antwerp or... Probably in Antwerp or, or nearby. And, and one of her uh, texts reflects a, uh, attacks upon beggings. And uh, we know that one of the inquisitors, uh, Robert de Bulgra, did indeed execute a begging in the middle mm. of the 12th century. And that's one of the ways that Hadwig is actually, uh, is actually dated. Uh, but other... Yes. Other scholars have said there's no evidence that these texts were known before the 14th century, before the 1330s and 1340s, so maybe she didn't live in the middle of the 12th century. However, this, this one text that indicates a persecution of, of beggings for their religious ideas does indicate that there were problems. Now, Beatrice is a generation earlier still, and Beatrice had been trained by beggings so that she knew how to read and write, but she herself becomes a Cistercian nun. And so she's living in an established religious order. Uh, and in that sense, it's a safer environment than, than, than the contemporary begging uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, regard uh, Beatrice's book, Zeven Manieren van Minnen, yep. as a kind of um, book about spiritual guidance? Um, I think it much more a kind of expression of her own notion of the path to God. Mm -hmm. That's what the seven maniren actually are. There are mm -hmm. seven forms of love that, that lead us uh, to, uh, to God. And mm -hmm. so she had a position of authority within her community and may well have functioned as a spiritual guide, and we do have some evidence indicating that. But her book, which is really the earliest surviving, as I said, vernacular mystical text uh, is really a, a kind of handbook of mm -hmm. the path of love to God. And it's extremely fascinating uh, uh, book in that sense. Uh, it's interesting that it's in that seven maniera and that the phrase that many later medieval mystics use of living without a why. That's mm -hmm. the first term, time that I've been able to see that term actually in a mystical text. What does it mean? It means living in total spontaneity with divine love. Uh, so you live, you know, in, in ordinary life we ask why and wherefore for everything that we do. Mystics like Beatrice and then later on um, Marguerite Porette who uses that phrase, Meister Eckhart uses it extensively, say that when you have reached a certain level of awareness of God, when you've reached the level of union with God, you live without a why. Because you don't have to ask why or wherefore you're doing something. You live the way God does out of the divine spontaneous uh, goodness. So that's, mm -hmm. it, it really means a total way of life to live without a why. You no mm -hmm. longer say, oh, I'm doing this so that I can gain that. Or I'm doing this to avoid that. Whatever you're doing, you're doing because that's what God would do. study of the mystics changed your worldview? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> In what way? <laughs> well, I think uh, reading and teaching and writing on mysticism over many decades have given me a much deeper sense of something we've talked a lot about now in these last uh, uh, minutes, that is the notion of finding, trying to find God, a deeper sense in everything that we do, in every moment of life. And uh, the more I read the mystics, I see this as a kind of essential part of their message. And so to read them and not to try in some way to realize that mm -hmm. in, in your own life, I think would, would be 
schizophrenic in that sense. So I, I try to keep that part of the message, in, in my mind at least. What's your image of God? Um, my image of God, I guess, let me put it in, in mystical language. The mystics talk about uh, God both, uh, let me, technical term, both cataphatically and apophatically. Cataphatically means they talk about God very positively. Apophatically means that because God lies beyond everything that we know, they have to talk negatively. You have to deny predicates of God. So when, when I think of God, I obviously have a, a cataphatic uh, image, if you will, a positive image, and that image is fundamentally love. God is loving father and loving mother, as, as Julian of Norwich uh, says, and as many other mystics say. Uh, apophatically or negatively, God is, is also ultimate mystery, an unknowable mystery, a mystery that we always can keep pursuing both here and hereafter. So somehow, uh, and this is the function of our own limited understanding and existence, we have to try to keep both the, the cataphatic, the, the loving mo father, mother, and mystery one and the same. Mm. And that's my kind of response to you mm. uh, about my, my image of God, if you will. If I ask you to, to give me a word, who you are, uh, what, what would you say? What would be most specific for you as to uh, indicate? A Christian, I hope. If you want one word. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. I thought okay. you would say I thought you would say a teacher. <laughs> so you got me. It's a Christian. Well, I, <laughs> or a Christian teacher, if you, yeah. if you will. I mean, my, my own self identity is very much of the, uh, that of the teacher. But I think yeah. the teacher is one vocation among many. What's yeah. much more fundamental yeah. is uh, is uh, is the believing Christian. And uh, but people can take that in very yeah. many yeah. different directions. My own life and my own gifts uh, and my own desires lie in the direction of teaching, research, teaching, writing. Yeah. But teaching is very much yeah. a center of that. Well, what makes you say that you want to specify that you're a Christian in this multicultural world? Well, I think we all have to uh, specify what we are, where we come from. In that sense, and of course, being a Christian doesn't mean that you're putting yourself aside from the human race. I mean, the obligation of the Christian, as I understand it from the Gospels, is is love of all. In that sense, in imitation of Christ, who came to redeem the whole of uh, of humanity. So, to say that you're a Christian doesn't say that well, I belong to this little group, and everybody else can go to hell, if you will. It's to say that you have a responsibility. But you also want to declare where that responsibility comes from, from your own perspective, and it comes from your, from your life as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why I would put, put the phrase that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you would say a Christian, a teacher, and a responsible teacher, kind of that. Is yes, that, thank is that you. a good... Uh... I, I, I could very well agree with that. I'll sign the dotted line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, right, so happy Professor McGinn. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We've got a little present for you, Bernard. Oh. This is the book I did in the second.